This is Six Tackles with Gus, with Matthew Thompson and Gus Gould. Great to be back with Six Tackles with Gus for another week, heading into round two. How good was the footy last week? Gee, there's some cracking fixtures to come this weekend as well. We'll preview uh, everything with Phil Gould very soon. Plenty of news to talk about as well. Welcome, Gus. Matthew Thompson, how are you doing? Great. You well? I'm extremely well. You look well. Buzzing around. What did you make of the doggies first up? I was all right. I was happy with them. I thought they showed great commitment. Uh, Got a lot of work to do on their attacking game, obviously, and they've got to get their share of the ball, which has been a bit of an issue for them. But Mm. I think defensively it was was a nice improvement, and hopefully they can maintain that. So last weekend there was some – gutsy defensive performances, and we'll, we'll review some of the best of them, but we've got an Ask Gus question straight off the top, which I liked. It was sent to me a, a message on social media from a lad called Whitey who says, Gus, who's the best defender ever? And I thought, what a bloody good question. The best defender ever? Yeah. All right, well, let's let's work out what we were dealing with here. The best defender, you're talking about the best tackler? Well, I don't The best know. hitter? Or the actual best defender, because there's so a big if you difference. Were, if you were coaching a team and you could pick one person in your defensive setup, what about that? I, I've known a lot of great tacklers over the years, like really good technique tacklers, mm-hmm. hard tacklers, uh, fellas that were had great technique in hitting hard. And, All right, what about what about we'll do a couple? What about best technique you've uh, seen? Best technique was David Gillespie, by a long way. Cement, cement. Yeah, he had a he had a great technique. Um, Chris Mortimer had a great technique um, of, of tackling. What about Jake? Uh, Jake Trebojevic which is a wonderful technique. Jake Liam Martin hmm? uh, has a wonderful technique for actually hitting and and sticking one out. You know, What's one, a great technique? What do you look for? Balance. Um, yeah, just balance. Yeah. Contact. Um, stickability. You know, impact. Yeah. You know that that's. Um, the, you, when you see a good one, you, you can tell. Mm. Um, they've got really good sense of timing and they've got no fear, obviously. But, you know, their head's out of the way. They rarely get hurt um, and people don't like running at them. Who were the great uh, technical defenders that you played with or um, against? Yeah, look, there was, look, there's been a lot of them over the years. By, by defender, uh, I throw a few things into the category and I think – the greatest defender, the greatest um, defensive mind in the game was Cameron Smith. Mm. I think, you know, what he was able to control through his actions in defence, not only um, in, in playing his own position, but his awareness, his cover defence, his organisation, um, his control in the tackle, his control of the momentum of the game. He was a wonderful defender, you know, didn't have a great tackling technique, had a great wrestling technique, you know, but he, he, had, a great, he, he had a great defensive mind. You know? um, of the blokes I coached, uh, Luke Rickardson was a great defender because he did a lot of work other than his own. He covered for a lot of other people and he had such a great constitution for work and there have been plenty of those over the years. Um, so I, I see defender as a little bit different to a tackler mm-hmm. and fellas with unique tackling technique. Um, but it, it's so hard. I, I would love to get people and take them to training and not even in the game, but take them in the training and stand them close to just how the action, just to see how quickly it, everything moves and flashes before your eyes, you know, reading mm. the defence and seeing the defence and how big and strong these players are and how fast they are. Our, our players are so good. They really are. Rugby league is so hard. I don't, I don't think fans and commentators really get a true Mm. a true indication of what these players are putting themselves through out there. It's it's really difficult, and they do a wonderful job for the most part. Mm. Uh, the reason I like that question is because I knew the answer would surprise me. So Cam- is your answer Cameron Smith? My, my answer is for someone who, yeah, Cameron Smith was a great defender, and all his teams were great defensive teams, and, I, and, 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 and emanated, I think, from his. His leadership, his control, his direction. He, he was also a great... Um, student of what the opposition were doing. So often he would just be in the right place at the right time where he'd be up there stopping a play from even running. He might not even be making the tackle. He might not even be – he's just in the way of what you were trying to do or where you were trying to go. And he would balk ball players. He'd balk dummy halves. He'd balk the playmakers. He would be in the face of a potential ball runner before he got the ball. Therefore, he didn't become – he was just 
really good at reading what everything was happening in the opposition team. I rated him as a really great defender. And, of course, in his own technique, I mean, he very, very rarely got hurt. He very, rarely, rarely missed tackles. We didn't miss tackles. Um, he was great at controlling the ruck, but he was a great reader of defence. Um, the other one was the boy who played for um, for Broncos at fullback. What was his name? Um, Darius Boyd. Yeah. He was the first of the fullbacks who became a great organiser in the line, up in the go- in the defensive line and playing very, very short in defence. And- he used to save a lot of tries. Yeah, well, it's, it's become – he was sort of like the pioneer of the way fullbacks defend now on their goal line. Of course, rule changes helped because they you, know, you, you don't have to have market defenders on the on the goal line. And, um, you know, with the seven tackles set, they're not grubber kicking into the end goal as much. So it was – he was sort of the pioneer of that, but he was a brilliant defender as well uh, for what he did for the defensive line and how easy he made it for everyone else. You can blow me over. I never would have thought Cameron Smith would be the answer because everyone thinks Cameron Smith's the, the great – you know, the subtle attacker and, you know. He was a great defensive mm, mind. Yeah. He was a great defensive reader. He was he, he was annoying to opposition teams, I can tell you. <laughs> On a few levels. Did, um, but when you were coaching, but the lock forward was the, he was your main defen- defensive, like he was your workaholic, wasn't he? And I suppose to a certain degree he still is. Yeah, the, the role of the lock forward has changed mightily during the, the course of history. I mean, back in the old days, lock forwards used to be cover defenders. Yeah. You know, like a Johnny Raper or Ron Coote might defend behind the line. And your halfback did too, which is the Well, halfbacks were little, so they, they defended behind the line. It, was, you know, it wasn't was until the you know, late 80s, early 90s that halfbacks started to play in the line, and they had to because attacks became better at what they were doing, and we went to a 10-metre rule, which made it difficult. But in the early days, we had cover defenders. Lock forwards were renowned as cover defenders. Um, mm. Halfbacks were renowned as cover defenders. They weren't defending in the front line. So you'd have had a defensive line with the main line, but you'd have the, the lock and the halfback behind. Yeah, well, Gra- Graham, when I played at Newtown, Graham O'Grady Grady was our lock forward. They used to call him the Minister for Defence. He organised our defence. And, and all he did was run around and fill in the holes where it needed to be filled in. And, oh, yeah. and he was the cover defender. So if we missed up front, Graham would round him up at the back. Greg Alexander was a great cover defender. Steve Mortimer was a great cover defender. If you remember, Peter Sterling used to defend at fullback and they put Paul Taylor up in the line. That's going back in those days, you know. But as defensive structures changed and the game changed, um, you know, and it's, it's made it hard for little blokes, particularly at junior league levels and that, and that's why we haven't got all the smaller, skillful players coming through the game. It's, a, it's all part of the issue. And, and halfbacks having to learn to defend in the line. And our halfbacks have got bigger physically. They've had to get bigger physically. Mm. To handle that, I'm just thinking about a nine-man defensive line with the wingers back and the two, like you're locking your halfback in behind. Look, yeah, how different look, is that? I keep saying that's cool. I keep saying it's a different planet back then. Mate. Hey, what about? But, well, better, better get going. What about Jeff Tuvey? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, the, yeah. Je- Je- debatably Jeff, the toughest footballer. Ever. Jeff. Jeff was a brave defender. He was a brave defender, but he was small, and he only had short arms. And I used to say to our blokes, don't run at him and think you're going to run over him because you can't, right? But what you've got to go to him is in twos and threes and try to get a pass onto one of his arms, you know, yeah. get the pass late so he has to make a decision late. But Jeff Turvey, I'd say to our big blokes, don't run at him and think you're going to run over him because you won't. He's, he was a free. He'll, he'll make his tackle. The crowd gets excited. He gets excited. Manly get excited. That's not what you want. Yeah. But if you want to take advantage of him, you've got to run to him with two or three options and try to get him wrong-footed and then – yeah, you know, because he was small, they just haven't got the physicality to do it. You know, we, we saw a lot of um, halfbacks there getting shoulder injuries and all sorts of things. And even the great players, the great halves, missed tackles, you know. Did you um, coach him in origin? Jeff Tooby played, yeah, but he played dummy half for us. Yeah, but like, that's but defending in the middle, like he's he'd be what, five foot two? Jeff, yeah, he wasn't very big. Like tiny. But extremely brave. Brave. Extremely brave. brave. Bravest ever. Yeah. Bra- well, bravest ever. Well, they're all brave. Yeah. yeah. But particularly the little blokes. And you, you often wonder about, oh, gee, he's going to be big enough. But they they've, mm. they grow up with it. It's what they want to do. They've got great constitutions. They've got you know, great courage. And like I say, I, I would love for fans and, and, and commentators who haven't played the game to actually come out and stand in the middle and and – and get a feel for the physicality of what they do, the speed at which they move, the 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 way the the amount of time you've got to make decisions and make decisions on big, fast people that are moving quickly, and it's amazing that they defend the way they do. You know, yeah. Some of the defensive performances we saw on the weekend were just incredible. The Melbourne Storm performance was incredible. In it defense. was, yeah, it really was. Hold that thought. All right. No, 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 no. Hey, no. That's the rule. No. 
now. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. I'm just watching a promo for Married at First Sight. I've, I've, oh. Have you ever watched Maths? Well, I, I caught up with three episodes last night and I was so, so angry. So you watched three back to back? Yeah, three back to back. Oh, it's, a, I, I'm, and I went I to bed watched, angry. I yeah, can't, which, which one did you watch? It's, uh, I watched the last three. Oh, man. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's a real chip off the old block, old mate, personal trainer. What's his name again? <laughs> I can't remember his name. He's, he's got them all on the hop. Oh, so my wife watches it and I sort of sit there begrudgingly to support her, but you, you sort of get invested a little bit. Yeah, it's a great show. <laughs> She's fair thinking. Great show, It's paying our wage. Yeah. Um, looks like the shit's about to hit the fan at the dinner party, Gus. Um, oh, yeah, I'd love a seat at the next dinner party. You know what they do? They just get them full of ink <laughs> and they just all yell at each other. That's life, baby. It's a pretty simple <laughs> simple recipe. Yeah. I can take you to a dozen restaurants on a Saturday <laughs> night and get 100%. the same stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, they just get they just rip into the drink for two hours and then they start the dinner party. That's it. That's it. Uh, Zach Lomax reminds me of the old nightclub, the Panthers. <laughs> Evan Theatre? <laughs> what, what do we used to call it? Reactor One. Oh, Reactor that? One, yeah. <laughs> Freddie used to do his best work. Uh, Zach Lomax, best positions on the wing. No. No, 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 no. It's not his best position, but he's got the ability to play it. He's pretty and, good on the and, weekend. And, and play it. Well, he was. He was good on the weekend. You know, he's... um. And did a, real, a terrific job for his team. And we discussed this on 100% footy on Monday night. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the coach's decision and the coach is right. You can't, you can't knock what the coach has decided and, and Zach's got to get into line with that, um, whether or not he's happy playing that position. There, there, there is this stigma, you know, with footballers sometimes if they're not wearing the right number or they're not playing in the right position. And we try to ingrain in them for a young age. It doesn't matter where you get picked and what position you get picked and – whether you're coming off the bench, whatever, you, you've got a role to play and it's your job to play that role. Mm. Um, and down the track, he can decide whether or not, um, you know, that's going to give him a chance of playing representative football or earning more money or whatever it is. I don't... He's not that and, 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 and I don't... I, I tend not to worry too much about media reports of players being unhappy, what have you, but it's quite common for a player to be picked out of position and not be happy with it. Mm. But you've then got to get in, and which he's doing. He's getting in and playing it to the best of his ability. That's to his credit. You know, now... He wants to be a centre. They moved him from right centre to left centre. They moved him to fullback. He signed his last contract because they were going to make him a fullback. Um, you know, then he's you know the club was going poorly, you know, and for no reason. I couldn't understand why they were going poorly because they had some really good players, and he was one of them. I've, I've often said in conversations, you know, mm. with the, the fellas around the Origin, I said, don't be ever afraid to pick Zach Lomax. I mean, he's Origin tough. He's Origin mentality. And he would make things happen in an Origin game that could get you a win. I just, what if he found himself on the wing for New South Wales in an Origin game? Well, I don't think he'd complain about that. No. Yeah, and but, but he, he could do it. Of course, he could. And he's a great jumper. Of course, he could. He's a big thing that best, can get you out of trouble. Best kick chaser in the game. Strong body can score tries that other blokes can't score from close range. He's one of them blokes that the ball bounces for, or he makes he other does. players make mistakes. He forces turnovers in other players. And he's just got to settle down in his own mindset and be happy to be doing a job for the team. It's about being selfless. It's about it's about team first mentality. It's not easy. It's easy to say. It's not easy for players to accept that, uh, particularly if they feel it's to the detriment of their long term career or to the detriment of. But if he keeps getting men in the match awards and he, and the team keeps winning and he keeps playing an important part, eventually they settle down with it. Now, like I said to you. You know, every year we get a list of off-contract players from other clubs. There's never a winger on there. They're all full-back centers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want him to play on the wing at the moment. You know, the, none of them call themselves wingers. But how important... It's a winger, full-back, winger, centre, centre winger, centre, full-back. Uh, you know, half-back winger. Half-back winger. You know, like, <laughs> the, every, no one puts down that they're just a winger. Yeah. Ever. And there's this... But, it, it, it's just a thing. I don't know what it is. But how important are the... Is the wing position in the modern game extremely important? Extremely. They get important. more football than centres, largely. Extremely important. It's like, it's like trying to hide a bad fieldsman at cricket. Yeah, you know, wherever you hide, wherever you put a bad fieldsman, they hit the ball. You can't hide a bad fieldsman. If your wingers aren't up to first grade standard, you're in trouble. Even though there are eleven other positions on the field, you're in trouble. You know, the wingers are vitally important, particularly in you know catching the ball, catching the ball, the high ball getting the ball out of the back end of the field, you know, defensive, all the defensive decisions they've got to make. It's it's a nightmare of a position. Mm. It's a nightmare of a position, you know, and, and probably for some time, I guess, compared to other positions, they were underpaid, which is why you never get on 
their resume that they're a winger. They always say they're a fullback or a centre. Resume, Josh at yeah. a car position. Can play fullback. F- can can play <laughs> five can play five. <laughs> well he said he was a fullback when the Bulldogs signed him. What, Josh had a car? Go back go back to when they signed him. He was saying you wanted to play fullback back then. Please. Please. So, you know, that's – that's I don't know why Brian that's – Brian Toto, position, 5-8. But, that, but that's been in the game for I can't remember how long, you know. And, and some blokes are just dead-set wingers. That's all they are is a dead-set winger. But the role of the winger in our game is so important. Hmm. It's so important. Yeah. Well, wing's cool, Zach. I, I, are you saying that you're not entirely convinced about the reports he wants out? Or he has been – he's been approached. They've been approached, the Dragons. With a view to releasing him, well, I doubt they'll release him. No, they've said they won't. Yeah, but I, I you know, I, like I say, I take all that with a grain of salt. Um, I think if there is any sense that he's shown um, that he was unhappy with it, clubs will sort of sniff around that and try to make approaches to it. Okay, um, but I can't see the Dragons at the moment letting anyone go until they get some results on the board. They need them all hands on deck. Is it uncommon for a club just to come to you and say, oh? What about Joe Bloggs? Like, we're interested, and you go no. Uh, what well, does it happen regularly? You get discreet. There's an anti-tampering oh, right. law. Right, you can't be talking to players off, on contract. Right, but you know, you you do get um, confidential inquiries if mm. this happened or that happened, hypotheticals and right. whatabouts and all that sort of thing. So it'll come through mainly through player managers or people you know in the clubs because everybody knows each other and what do you think about this and what do you think about that. I think if we made if we made trades easier and more accessible to all clubs, I think that that would open that up a little bit. I think there's always opportunity for, for clubs to trade players. What happens anyway? Why don't they just make it like you can trade players? I don't know. Well, it to, happens all the time To be honest, anyway. mate, there's, there's not a lot of players off contract at the moment. Most players, right. are, there's, you know, we've, we've got a shortage of players at the moment. Until we get our development pathways up and running again, so and the reality I don't, is think, any, I don't yeah. think any clubs letting go of NRL talent at no. the moment, Anyone well, unless clubs? it's unless it's a trade off for something else that they need, yeah. you know. So, but Zach Lomax, um, it's not his best position. I think right centre is his best position, but he's playing really well at where he is, and he's doing a wonderful job. And I think if they keep winning, well, then all that sort of noise will go away. You like the new short dropout rule. No, 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 no. No, I don't. <laughs> I find it boring. <laughs> it's, do you know what? It, it doesn't really change much anyway because no one really took the penalty goal, like, if it didn't go well, 10 but, anyway, uh, did they? But how can there be no consequence if you don't get it right? There's got to be a consequence. Well, you hand the ball over 10 metres. Well, if, if you're going to do that, if you're going to do that, then there should, be, there should still be some reward for forcing a line dropout. Right at the moment, that reward has been dissipated greatly. All right, so mm. if you just wanted to simplify that and not have the risk, and I think a lot of this is the risk of they're saying because it's you know it's a bit more like rugby. We're going we're to have blokes being lifted up shortly to make catches. I can I can guarantee it. I know there are teams practicing it. We're going to start getting tall blokes lifted up oh, to catch these short kickoffs, I never and that, of that. which is ridiculous. So you're practicing that at Billmore? Uh, no, but. Maybe. Um, I'm telling you that coaches will keep looking at it because there is now no re- – and what you're seeing is less kicking on tackle five because yeah, yeah. the, the reward's really not there to put it down in goal like it used to be. All right? You're a 50-50 chance of getting the ball back anyway. You know, you're only now a 50-50 chance of getting the ball back where if you forced a line dropout, you were a 100% chance of getting the ball back. And if they wanted to risk a short dropout at a vital time of the game, well, then it could cost them two points as well. Yeah. But there's no penalty if they don't get it right. Yeah. So yeah. – um, if you just wanted to, and I think some of this is they're trying to reduce the number of big, heavy collisions. So when you kick downfield and you know, they pass it off to the front row and he comes tearing back into the line 100 mile an hour, that's where you get a lot of your, your injuries and your head clashes, right? So we're talking about the concussions and all that sort of thing. So if we can reduce the number of those, if we can have a softer landing because they put the ball up in the air and everyone just jumps up for it and, and all that, I think they're trying to stop that as well. Mm. Now, well, when's the kickoff? We're going to get rid of the but, kickoff. But, but if you're going to reward the, the action of forcing a line dropout, or forcing the opposition back into the in goal, or forcing their opposition player to tap the ball dead because they're, you know, they're trying to save a try, then there has to be some reward for the attacking team. The reward for the attacking team could simply come back. It'd be like held, being held up over the try line. Mm. Come back and play the ball on the you know, it's tackle zero. Come back and play the ball on the ten metre line, and you keep the ball and you keep going. Well, ever I can keep forcing a line dropout, I get another set of six. Yes. and go again. Yes. All right. Yes. 
So I, I don't know. Yeah, I, it's a little I bit like that. a little bit like but people have seen it and oh that was exciting and that was good. They took a risk there and they got the ball back. That's beautiful. Therefore, more of it must be better. Mm. I don't necessarily agree with that. And what I think it's going to deteriorate into is sides are not going to give a hoot. They'll just kick it, and if it doesn't go 10 metres, well, who cares? They've got the ball anyway. So and that's the hardest place to break through a defence, as, we, as we've seen. It's the easiest place to defend. Yeah. 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 I, I still think there needs to be a reward, and if it means we're going to have less grubber kicking into the end goal and less um, you know, attacking plays from kicks, well, I don't know that that's a good uh, – yeah. yeah. Penrith, in particular, in the World Club Challenge, and even down at Melbourne the other night, have – I know. have decided they're going to run the ball on tackle five most of the time yeah. because there's there's really no guarantee you're going to get the ball back if you force a line dropout. I, I, li- I like the whole sustained pressure thing, like good halfback, kick to the end goal, yeah. get it back again, do all it right. again, well, if they and do, you get put three defensive sets in. So them. if you force them in goal, all right, come back to the 10-metre line, zero tackle, play it, let's get on again. You know, And that, that keeps the game moving, whatever yeah. you do. But what we're going to have to do is the 30-minute delay where he takes the kick and then... You're going to kick it up and then, well, who caught it? Oh, knock on. Yeah. Okay, well, now we'll have a scrum. We're going to have a lot of that. We're going to have a lot of knock ons and we're going to have a lot of rubbish over there. Oh, he escorted him. Oh, he bumped him. Oh, he, he went up too early. He went up too late. You know, I did it touch. Can we go to the video referee? Can we have a, can we have a captain's challenge and, have a, and see whether he touched that or touched that? It's going to drive you mad. I'm telling you, it's going to drive you mad. I understand the thinking behind it, but that wasn't the solution in my eye. I find it, and I think it's going to become. Boring. Well, yes. Well, I, I'm with you now. See, he thinks about things differently. Um, Australia and New Zealand need to play more cricket tests against each other. Hundred percent. Wasn't that a great last day? Terrific. Did you, you Isn't were, Test cricket just wonderful? It's the best. It's the best. I love Test cricket. Well, if New Zealand caught Mitch Marsh second over of the day, game set, bingo. But mm. they didn't. Catches win matches. Drop catches, lose them. They do. They do. We were gone a couple of times in that one, mm. uh, but uh, great, uh, great second half fight back, second innings fight back. Pat Cummings too. I mean, he's <sighs> he's fourth innings average. I think is better than some of our better batsmen now. He's brilliant. That he's situation. been terrific the in that situation. Man. He keeps the why does he why does he going? come in after Stark? Because I think they like the fact that Stark can score quick, and he's sort of a bit of a backstop. But he's a better batsman than Stark. He didn't get many this time. No, no. didn't get any. No. no. He keeps the scoreboard. See, in those situations at the end of games, when you're trying to win a test, the inclination is just to defend, defend. Well, Cummins actually puts a bit of pressure back on them. Yeah, well, they're super yeah. cricket. If you were going to pick one cricketer in the world in your team, mind you, while the opposition is trying to get wickets to win, and New Zealand had to get wickets to win, fieldsmen are up, the field placings are different. Mm. There is scope to yeah, play your shots. If you, if you if you try to defend it, you're more likely to get out. Yep. For those types of batsmen, mm. they've got to you know they've got to play their shots. And Pat Cummings did it brilliantly. Mm. I thought Carey was terrific. That you know, was super. Yeah. Needed to. Yeah. I, I, at the end of the at the end of the prior day, I thought, well, it'll be up to Head and Marsh. They're the ones, but um, he didn't last too long. Head. No, he's been in a little bit of a rut. Which seems more, more Test cricket, the better. More Test cricket, the better. And they're a Love good it. side, but they just can't beat Australia. That, it's it's become a mental thing with them. Um, lastly, Melbourne Storm are a step above the rest of the comp when it comes to preparation and training. No, 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 no. But they're very good. They're outstanding. Mm. I think they've set the standard for a number of years. I think everyone's catching up. Um, I think that Melbourne Storm obviously were the standard in our competition for a long time there under Craig Bellamy, and they obviously had that that brilliant run and they produced all those great players. Um, And a number of those, number of people who worked in that organisation have gone to work for other clubs. People have extracted expertise out of there. People have gone down there to study and, and watch what they do. The Melbourne Storm themselves, the personal development of their coaches and coaching staff, uh, working with um, senior AFL teams and working with um, going over to regular tours to America and England and seeing how professional sports are run overseas. A very professional organisation, privately owned, of course. But, um, yeah, and I think Craig Bellamy has probably set the standard for professionalism along the way that all other clubs and teams have aspired to. Um, but set, to do that in round cert- one. Certainly a lot of – oh, it's, it's an incredible record. It is an incredible record. And to defend the way they did, round one well, normally you're, you're straight, you know, your, your fitness isn't quite there, but they, they th- just... That was, that was ridiculous. How good was that? That was ridiculous. You just, you couldn't look away because you said they can't keep getting no. up and doing this. But the blokes on the ground trying I, to make I, tackles. I can't remember them down the other end of the field all that second half. No. 
you know, and when when the the no try I think was a try, but um, had Panthers got that one, they might have got a couple. But are you talking about the obstruction? Yeah, don't start me on obstruction. No, but I could sort of see where that'll, that'll, that'll lead to penalty it. tries and captains challenges and all the other stuff we had to put up yeah, on yeah. the weekend. We're not yeah. going to talk about it. So. On that basis, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. I'll, I'll ask you this, these questions every week. Right. Most impressive team from round one, which went over two weeks, of course. Uh, the one that impressed me the most was Raider. Raider? Because I didn't see that coming. Yeah. I, th- I thought Newcastle would handle them pretty comfortably. But Raider played the perfect round one performance. They just allowed – they really just uh, – very similar to the Roosters. They just allowed Newcastle to beat themselves and self-implode. And I think – that's what the Roosters did to the Broncos too over in LA. I think they played the perfect round one game. The Storm, their defence was incredible. Roosters very, very uh, deliberate in their um, defeat of uh, the Broncos. Dragons, oh, obviously, gonna... Dragons obviously powerful, but uh, I think Titans would be disappointed the way they turned up. I was going to say Shark. Sharks, Shark, um, that's probably as good a win as I've ever seen them have. Oh, that was unbelievable. Yeah. Well, they, they were down 12 nil away from home in front of that big crowd against a really good side, a top four side. No and ball. No ball. No ball, but found a way to keep holding into it. Scored just after, before half time, scored just after half time, got themselves in the contest, but had to defend their line um, stoically for a long period of time. The surface was a little damp, which makes the ball moving a little worse. And, and, you know, attacking games aren't in sync really around round one, so that gives them every chance. But I thought that was as tough a win as I've ever seen a Cronulla team have in a long time. And it, And it's. A really good sign. You know, they've been thereabouts the last couple of years and they get to the end and haven't quite matched it. Well, that's a fair indication that they've gone away and done their homework and come back in really good shape for this year. So, I saw, actually, we, we watched that game down at Amy Park before um, Melbourne Penrith kicked off. And a couple of times I thought, this is really impressive. They had no... They, it, after 20 minutes, the possession count was 85% of the Warriors. Yep. And when Cronulla got it, Nico Hines kicked the ball early in the count a couple of times. Yeah. I got it down the other end, and they just went down and tackled again. Played, I thought, wow! Played the conditions and played yeah. and played back their fitness the whole way through it. No, no, it was a really, really impressive. But out of all the games on the weekend, the one that shocked me the most was Raider mm. um, belting the night. You know, ran away from it at the end, but um, they were just too good for that. I thought that was really, really impressive. Uh, all the other ones were good wins. There was probably only a couple of disappointments on the weekend. I think you know, Titans not, are ordinary. It's not as though. Um, um, I thought Cowboys were impressive, obviously, but, mm. you know, it's only early season form. Those that got beaten in round one have got a chance to bounce back this week and, and um, the others have got to do it again. Who was the most impressive player? The most impressive player in the weekend. Our man Jordan's left a name off that list. Yeah, I, 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 I was happy for the young St. George fullback, Sloan. Yeah. Who's, you know, he's... he's these, these young fellas that come in and they've got flair and they've got talent and they're still getting used to the grind of training and playing in the NRL and they get targeted by opposition teams and they make a few mistakes and people jump on them really quickly and um, I often feel sorry for them kids. But, you know, the ones that come through it, it's, it's you know, the, the scars heal and I think he healed a lot of scars with his performance the other night. He's, he's certainly a really, he's a wild card for them. He's an X factor. And I was really happy for him. I was really happy for Luke Brooks uh, in his performance for Manly, uh, his first one over there, um, playing with Tom Trebojevic and Daly Cherry Evans, who, again, in sparkling form. Um, but I was, I was really happy for Terrell Sloan uh, in the way he performed. Uh, but there were a lot of, a lot of good performances, some in the shadows that people don't see as much. Yes. You see the flashy ones, but you don't see the ones in the shadow. There were, so I thought there were some really heroic defensive performances in those Sharks and... Mm. Um, and storm games. Yeah, I wonder how Cameron McInnes's head looks after all those tackles. Um, I, don't, I don't think he cares. The bloke that you made a, a big statement about a couple of years ago, Jeremiah Nane, looks like he's been in the gym all off season. He could take the competition by storm this year. Yeah, well, they're a good side, and he's he's a weapon. Yeah, no doubt he's a weapon. He's a he's an attacking force. He's he's going to influence games. Um, Jeremiah, what team could improve dramatically this week? Team that could improve dramatically this week, I think, will be Bronco. Mm. I think they'll improve. Um, I do think, uh, yeah, probably Broncos the one, and I think Newcastle will improve. I think 
Uh, Newcastle just looked to me like looked to me like they've had a good off season, but they came out and tried to show everyone what they've been doing rather than just concentrating on doing the fundamentals and getting them right. And I right think they'll yeah. they'll tone that down a little bit this week. Uh, it's a good game, them and the Cowboys. I just oh, how good a game is that? Yeah, in good, fact, there's a it's a great week of footy. There's some good matchups. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, all right, I don't want to don't want to labour the Lenny thing. It's gone on forever, eight weeks. I, I just hope. I just hope that a part of this ban includes some, in light of what's happened about him not understanding the gravity of what he said, etc. I just hope part of this ban includes some element of um, awareness or educational training, etc. Because rubbing a player out for eight weeks is 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 a severe punishment. But where's the where's the learning from this? Well, I think the learning has been in the publicity and the public comment and the embarrassment and everything that's happened around that. I, I would have liked to have seen far less of that and I'd have liked to have seen the matter dealt with immediately, um, you know, both from uh, uh, from Lenu's point of view, from the Roosters' point of view and the NRL's point of view, but it took the course that it did. It took eight days to get to a result. Whether it's 12 weeks, eight weeks, six weeks, I don't – people arguing over the length of the, 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 the penalty – the penalty is in the lesson that's been learned. Mm. Um, no amount of penalty is going to repair whatever hurt um, the target of this felt at the time, and it's only him that's been offended. Um, so it's um, well, actually, I think I think the indigenous community's been yeah, but that's what I, he's the one that understands. He's the one that's been targeted. That that's what I'm saying. Yes. So he, he he nothing's going to fix that. No, of course not. Right? doesn't matter if we give the bloke life. It's not going to fix that. That's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. An eight-week suspension is, is a – but does an eight-week suspension – But I think I – If think, it's a four-week suspension and three weeks of it is in, is in I, a training, you know, process, like, yeah. does it make a difference? I, I, I don't know. I, I think that with all the publicity and all the public comment and everything, I think the message will be loud and clear to everybody mm. that didn't – if they didn't understand before, they understand now exactly what it is. So – um, you know, and as to anyone who wants to make comment on it, Ezra Mam is the one that knows most what that meant yep. to him yep. personally, is yep. what I'm saying. All right. So it doesn't matter if Spencer Landon gets 12 weeks or 100 weeks or whatever it is or two weeks, it's not going to change how he felt about that incident. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm shocked with some of the aftermath players coming out saying, oh, I've been called this, I've been called that. Like, I. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know who that helps. But anyway. Um, eight weeks. That's the way it is, and uh, it's all it's all in the books now. Ask us. Barring injury, could Daly Cherry Evans captain Queensland for another two series? And when he retires, oh, who could be the Queensland captain from Jonathan? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, Daly Cherry Evans is a marvel. I mean, what is he now? Thirty six. Yep. Uh, and twenty three. He doesn't look any different. I mean, watched him last week against. Uh, uh, when he played in that game against the Rabbitohs, he doesn't look any different. He's so comfortable in his game. He's so comfortable in his influence on the game. He's still remarkably athletic. Um, uh, he doesn't fear collision. Uh, he's showing no signs that you would normally associate with players at the back end of their career. Um, it'll be. I think he'll retire when he wants on his terms. I don't think the game will retire him. I don't think the game will ever go past him now. I, I can't ever see... You know, whether he wants to play for another couple of years, I don't know. Whatever he's going to play, I think he still holds his place in the origin side. So far as future origin captains, um, I think the young hooker from Melbourne will probably mm. be touted as a future leader. Um, they would probably be organising him for that. But, uh, and Carrigan. Um, got a few there. Carrigan's always got that um, type of uh, personality. Tino. As well. Tino, perhaps. But a front row, they're not on the field for the whole game. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would think that Harry Grant, you know, probably the likelihood down the track. But right at the moment, there's no need to be worrying about. Uh, mm. You know, Ben Hunt could be a Queensland captain as well. He's 35. He's still going well, strong well, too. A lot of our playmakers, are, yeah. you know, they're, um, they're not going to be around much longer. There's no shortage of leadership there for Queensland. It's got great complexion, Daly Cherry Evans. Would like to get what he uses on his skin. Great what? Complexion. His skin so healthy. My head just doesn't go there. Um, do we know what the international calendar looks like 
this year? If not, how can the international game grow when fixtures aren't known until nearly the end of the season, asked Michael. Yeah, I, I, that's that's part of why I would like the NRL to buy the English Super League and take over on the, the world calendar. I think we should have a rolling five-year calendar. I know mm. exactly what it was, so that way we get better organisation from our club football to our representative football and um, and try to make sure we put international football on the stage it deserves. I believe there are Pacific Island tests again at the end of this year. Okay. Um, but as yet, we don't have complete details of them. Greg asks, and I know the answer to the first bit of this question, are you a fan of the Ted Lasso TV series? And if so, could we all take a leaf out of his wisdom book? <laughs> There's a lesson in every episode. <laughs> It's a great a, show, isn't it? There's a lesson in every episode. He's a beauty, Ted Lasso. I like Roy Kent. <laughs> I've known a few Roy Kents in the time. <laughs> yeah. No, he's, his... he, he's unique, Ted. Really good. How yeah. do you think he'd go in the NRL? Huh? <laughs> How do you think he'd go in the NRL? They might find him out in the NRL. <laughs> <laughs> Be a goldfish. Be a goldfish, Greg. He's a, he's very... I haven't watched the last series of that. Ted Lasso? Yeah, I, I finished the last... it the other night. Did you? Yeah. Good? Yeah. I, I heard someone told me it's sad. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. I don't like watching sad stuff. Yeah, it is. It is. I won't spoil it for no, you. No, don't don't spoil it. Um, but it's no, it's brilliant. Would would you would you would you say it's as sad as married at first sight? <laughs> no, it's just irritating. It's, I'm angry. What made you angry? Uh, lots you, of lots of it. But give us some specifics. No, no. I want to be one of the judges. They don't have judges. No, the, the experts, oh, experts. The experts. Relationship experts. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Yeah. What would you say? No, don't put up with that <laughs> rubbish. Don't cop that. You can go. Gone. You, you two gone. Out. They need a sin bin, don't they? Yeah. They need a bunker. Yeah. Well, I suppose you've got to keep them in the game longer to do another show. But Well, mate, this nah. is the thing. How many of these... Look, the, the, the Sarah, who's got the quasi-American accent, mm. she's not interested in that bloke. Like, they are a million to one to see each other when this show's finished. Yeah. But they keep milking it so they can get their Instagram followers up. It's reality TV. Yeah, mate. but this is the thing. Like, they're, they're using this as a vehicle. Like, she's she's not interested in this poor bloke. Like, nah. she's been seeing the ex-boyfriend. Yeah, no. Nah. He's sitting there like a sad shag on a rock. Look at him. Was yeah. it, like, honestly. He's, he's racing He out. needs to pull his head in. He's racing out of his division there. <laughs> He's a maiden in Group Two company. He's a maiden at Kemmler, and she's Group One. <laughs> what an idiot state! She's, she's got him. <laughs> she's got him bluffed. Yeah, and then nah. old mate, old gym junkie with his tats everywhere. I, mean, no, I think he's going to go back to her. I think he's going. Yeah, I, I think he's going to. No. Yeah, I think, I think he's going to get sucked in. No, nah. I do. He can't. I think he will. There's got to be an. This is where you need to provide an intervention. Mate, he, he, what he said, leave. He should have just got up and gone. Yeah, I know. Now, now I'm out. Gone. Yeah. No, no, he's, no, he's going to sit back and cop some more. He's a sad sack, that He bloke. must have got a pay rise. And, mate, there's a, there's a couple of them. How'd they get on? They, they must have had limited auditions this year, fair dinkum. No, no, they're a good group. I like the group. What? Well, it's very diverse, yeah. I like, I like the different... I like, I like Tim and... Um, they're all different. They're all different. I like Tim and um, Lucinda. And I like the way they all interfere with each other's business. I know. Yeah, they're into Feedback each other. Feedback week. It's yeah. like, it's not feed, it's muckraking week. Yeah, it's good. That's what we're there for. My wife actually but, thinks... But, but, yeah. see, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like the modern version of Days of Our Lives and all that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. You remember back to all those old shows they used to have? Yeah. Which were really corny yeah. and you couldn't watch. I couldn't watch them. No. Nah. But I can watch this. My wife thinks they're actually on there to find a partner. This is yeah. where she's completely yeah. deluded. Yeah. We, uh, we, I met them at a Channel 9 function uh, a few years ago. It was one of the really good seasons too and we met them at a um, sponsors function. Mm. They were, <laughs> they were all they were all out there. They were, <laughs> they were all, and they were all mates. Mm. You know, it was it was great. It was I great, but I, 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 she just made me so angry last night. I think there's a partner swap coming up. You reckon? Yeah, I think well, that's I, always I, good. I've seen the I've seen the promo. Really? A well, partner. I think I think one of them tries to have a crack at. Well, I think partner. I think I think the gym guys. He's up for it. I think he, he wants a partner swap. He's one of them. <laughs> he's been trying to get a partner swap for ages. He wants to swap with anyone. <laughs> he's all comers. <laughs> Except he won't. Actually, I won't go there. Um, six tackles trivia. Uh, Melbourne defeated Penrith uh, eight 0 Of course, uh, who was the last team to hold the Panthers to nil? In what year? Oh wow! No, oh, no idea. I said it during the call. Thanks for listening. Melbourne Storm, round twenty-two, twenty twenty-two, sixteen 0 at Blue Bet Stadium. 
Oh, that's when they had all the rep players out. Yep. Yeah. Nathan, Nathan Cleary, the first time he's ever been held to nil in an NRL game. Yeah. Um, just before we get into the preview. And he, and he made the team of the week. When? Well, no, someone advertised the team of the week and had him number seven. <laughs> the team didn't score a point. Well, the mass cast put that together, did they? <laughs> I don't know who was doing the voting. Um, oh, you see some very funny things in our game. It's oh, a funny it. game, rugby. Yeah. Right? It's a funny game. It's a strange, strange game. It's sometimes. a funny game. Um, yes, before we get to the preview, we are coming into racing season. Like, the championships isn't far away. A slipper. Every week's racing season. <laughs> if you're a man, Where have you been? <laughs> I've been on hiatus. <laughs> um, but if you're a racing fan, we've got a podcast uh, through the nine suite of podcasts called The Heart of Racing with Will Friedman, part of the Friedman Racing Dynasty, and Neil Breen, okay. who is a mad racing man. I've owned a horse oh, with I saw, Breen. I saw some shorts of that the other day. Mm. Yeah, no, good. They get some yeah. really good guests. Yeah. Um, so The Heart of Racing, you should podcasts tune in Podcasts are the thing now, aren't they? I know. You should learn all about them. Yeah. Um, How do you get your own podcast? I know. What about a vodcast? No. Uh, Slipper's coming up. That that horse of gaze looks like it's just about over the line. What's it called? Storm, um, Storm Boy. Boy. Did mm. it, it start a dollar ten or something the other day? Yeah. And win by how far? He won by a couple of lengths the other Did day. It? Yeah. Yeah. But it'll it'll win a slipper. I don't think it was. Well, some other ones there. Yeah. Mm. Right. Round There's two. It's a hard race to win. Oh my word! It's worth a fair bit of folding as well. Thursday night footy all kicks off at Suncorp Stadium. The team that Gus thinks are going to jump out of the ground in front of a full house against South Sydney. Coverage from 7.30, live and free. Um, not much doing with team news, I don't think. I should have probably pulled this up earlier. I think the Broncos are pretty much the same. South's, again, that back line depleted with a lack of centre depth. Didn't help them. Didn't help them over in Vegas, but the two teams that were beaten over in Las Vegas to do battle in Thursday night footy, Gus. Yeah, I think Bronco might recover best from that. Uh, and if they can just settle down and, and control the ball a little bit more and build their game over the course of the 80 minutes, they should have too many points in them for the Rabbit, who um, conceded 30-odd points in round one, and it could have been a lot more. Um, Manly had a couple of tries disallowed and uh, was certainly finding inroads into them almost on every set of six. So I, I think... Uh, Bronco should be able to get that one. And in fact, with respect to team news, Jai Arrow is gone. My oh dear. He has uh, suffered a, I can't remember what the injury is. That's no good. Might have been a shoulder. Mm. Um, but they're saying at least four weeks. So losing him is quite the blow. The early game on Friday. Have you prepared? Have you prepared the Bulldogs for a trip to the Bermuda Triangle? What sort of stuff would you be? I just hope the bus gets home. That's all. <laughs> Doesn't end up in that lockup of old buses. Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. Well, they've shown how tough they are to beat over in New Zealand. They'll be tough to beat, of course, uh, down at home. Uh, no, well, actually, I, I'm not going to say no, Fox, because he's named in jumper number twenty three. Yeah, and the coach said yesterday that he's asked to play, or he thinks he's still a chance of playing. So. Um, I think they'd pick the team with the thought that he was going to be out, but they've shoved him in on the bench just in case. Um, I would think it unlikely, and I think it was probably in his best interest to have a week off, uh, just to give it 100%, but he's a bit like that, the Fox. He's he's rung the coach and said, no, I'm, I'm still keen to go around. I want to be given till the last minute. So um, it's a short week. They play Friday night, 6 o'clock. There's only a couple of days to go. Today's their, their major training session, so they'll, mm. they'll probably sort it out today. I'll know when I get back to Belmore this afternoon. All right. Friday night footy, Gus. You'll be out there with myself and Joey to call the action and the rest of the team, of course, with the pregame and all the news. Penrith, para. The only team that seems to have the wood on the Panthers. The great news for Penrith is that Scott Sorensen is back. So is Mitch Kenny. So they have their full-strength pack available. Uh, and same team for Para, who did enough to get the job done against Canterbury in uh, the opening week. They Certainly, they've got the wood on Penrith recently. I wonder if they can continue. Well, they can get some good results, you know, and it doesn't really matter where they play. Um, the games seem to be very, very similar. They've upset Panthers a couple of times out there at Penrith and coming off the confidence of a round one win, um, in a game they were probably expected to win and they had a big home crowd there, sellout crowd, and um, you know, there's pressure in that for the home team as well and they were able to get a win. Um, but this will be the big challenge for them. And Panthers, of course, will did exactly what they did last year. They lost the World Club Challenge narrowly. They lost their first round narrowly. 
Um, I'm expecting a bounce back. I think Mitch Kenny's a big in for them. I think Sorensen's a big in. Um, and, you know, depending on the conditions there, and I can only assume that, you know, we'll have a fine day followed by a little bit of dew on the ground at night. Um, they're very good in those conditions. I um, I think I think Panther will bounce back. I expect Panther to win, but no one's going to be shocked if, the, if uh, Parramatta get them. Mm. They beat them towards a back puddle last year when they were pretty much out of finals. Yeah, well, I heard Ivan Cleary say the other day it was probably the one that steeled them a little bit in the run to the finals, that they probably needed that loss. And and what he said was they beat us point blank. He said there was no fluke to it. They, they just, you know, it, it probably unearthed a few things that they got a little bit lazy with or, you know, hadn't been exposed. And it steeled them then to make the run and win the competition. So he actually gave credit to that loss. And sometimes your team needs a loss late in the year just to... Um, refocus and get yourself going again. If you're winning every week and winning comfortably, it's never a, a comfortable feeling. But um, yeah, I heard him interviewed the other day saying that. Uh, so they'll have great respect for the Eels, and the Eels will have the confidence of knowing that no one gives them a chance again, and they've done it plenty of times before. So I think it'll be a nervous night for the for the Panthers. Big crowd, be a sellout crowd again. Be a great way to have Friday night football. I'm going to shout you some hot chips. Oh, yeah. Good hot chips out of Penrith. Oh, yeah. They get good, good food out of Penrith. Fantastic. Yeah. We better stay away from those donuts, though. <laughs> They're oh, no good for you. The compulsory donuts. <laughs> They're the best. Yeah. The problem is you eat one, you want to have ten. Um, Saturday, three o'clock down in Canberra, the Benji Marshall era officially gets underway as the West Tigers travel down the highway to take on the Raiders, who, as Gus has uh, already pointed out, were his team of the week last week for their upset victory up in uh, Newcastle. You can't help Gus but think there's a bit of synergy here. Benji's the coach, and in comes a new 5'8", a teenage 5'8", Lachlan Galvin, alongside Jaden Sullivan. Yep. A Caesar's on the bench, which is very interesting. But you just tell it's just it's just interesting that Benji, who debuted as a schoolboy, was picked a teenager in the six. Yeah, um, Lachlan Galvin, I think everyone's seen him coming for a number of years. He's been in the pathway system and the school system. Uh, he's obviously a very talented player. He's an NRL player of the future. It's a big ask to throw an 18-year-old kid in like this at this at this time, um, particularly away from home. Um, you know, Usually, you know, if I've been in this position, if I'm going to debut a kid, I like them to debut at home, feel a little bit more comfortable, make sure their family's with them and... The surroundings are a little bit more normal, and uh, but uh, you know they've got a huge opinion. To, as has has everyone. Everyone's got a huge opinion of this kid. Uh, is he know. a what 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 what's sort of his strength as a player? What, uh, what he, sort of a five eight is he? He's a left sided five eight. He's a ball player. He's a ball runner. He's actually got it all. He's got quite good instincts. Um, looking at him when he was younger, I kind of thought, well, will he be a five eight or will he be a, a back rower um, on that side? He's he's. He's a little bit slight in physique at the moment, but I think he's going to grow. Um, but he's got wonderful football instincts. He's quite quick, got quick hands, got quick between the ears. Um, this will be a different level altogether. I thought he was quite impressive in the trial. It's only a trial game, um, and they were, they were comprehensively beaten, but I thought he's had some really nice touches in there. A lot will come from the players around him. So he's, his back row partner, his fullback, and his centre are going to have to give him a lot of support with and without the ball. No doubt he'd be targeted. It's not a charity. The Raiders will be out there to give it to him, that's for sure. Um, Big physical pack, yeah, too. And, and, you know, and the other boy that they got, Jaden Sullivan, he's, he's still finding his feet in the NRL, too. It's not as though he's playing with a Daly Cherry Evans or he's playing with a Ben Hunt or he's playing with one of those senior playmakers. He's playing with a kid who's trying to find his feet as well. So it's, um, you know, but that, that's where the Tigers are. And as the, some of their kids come out of their pathways, it's going to be a tough couple of years as they get their grounding and as they get enough games under their belt. You know, like whatever he does at the moment, when he's played 50 or 60 first grade games, he's going to be a completely different player. And then when he gets to 100 first grade games, mm. then you've got someone who's really starting to influence results. So don't put too much pressure on him or expect too much. <clears throat> but he's a talented player. He's going to be a long time first grader. And, um, you know, and full credit to Benji for, for backing him and, and giving him the confidence. I hope the rest of the team, and they will. What usually happens is when you throw a kid in like this, the rest of the team lifts a little bit. Yeah, right. You know, and one of my things was if anything happens to him, it's on you. That, that would be my voice to all the forwards and all that sort of Nothing happens to him on your watch. And, and I think the Tigers will go in with that sort of mentality. Mm. He will be targeted by the Raiders. He'll be targeted by everyone he plays against. But I've, he's just one of them kids, I think, that was born to do it. He's going to. 
he's going to relish that challenge. The, the last person to be scared will be him, Lachlan Galvin. Oh. I, I guarantee you. There's a big rap. He's good a, stuff. He's a good kid. Uh, incidentally, too, Seb Chris is back for the Raiders. So Nick kotrick has gone to 18th man. They must have some strength if they've got an international. Um, Olam's unavailable because of injury. He had a knee, and Brent Naden got injured in the trial. So Solomona Fatape, who played with the Brisbane Tigers in the Queensland Cup last year, also makes an NRL debut. This might be the game of the round, this one. Well, there's a few of them, but I'm calling this one for radio. Continuous call team at 5.30 on Saturday, Cowboys Knights, Queensland Country Bank Stadium. Super game of footy. Two very talented teams. Same 17 for the uh, the North Queensland side. Tom Jenkins is coming in on the wing because Anari Tuala is out. And uh, Kai Pierce, Paul, who I think impressed everyone, Gus, with his time on the field uh, in the, the game last week, comes into the starting team because young uh, Dylan Lucas is injured. So a couple of changes for the Knights. Big yeah, we game. Sp- we spoke about Kai Pierce, Paul, last week. I gave you a bit of a rundown on what sort of player he was. <clears throat> and he's building physique. He's, he's, his physique is building nicely. He's going to be a, a handy player. He's obviously got good skill. Um, you know, it's the week-to-week, week-in, week-out, and he's got to get the defensive aspect of his game right, which I'm sure he will. He's a, he's quite a talented player. Mm. This is a, a very, very interesting one because I do think we'll see a, a bounce back from the Knights. I think they'll be disappointed with the way they presented themselves the other night and the type of football that they played and how easily they succumbed. <clears throat> and the Cowboys couldn't have been more impressive. Um, having said that, the Dolphins weren't great uh, on the day. Defensively, mm. they, were, they were fairly brittle. Um, I don't think we'll see that from the Dolphins too often. Um, yeah, this is really a tough one. Um, it's easy to pick the Cowboys over the Knights because of what we saw last week and the fact that it's being played in Townsville. But early season form can be a bit up and down. It tends to go a little bit win-loss sometimes, and we see a lot of upsets to public opinion at this time of year, and this is potentially one of them um, because I have got a good opinion of the Knights. Um, I'm Look... I really don't know. I'm going to favour the Cowboys just for the reasons that I've said and, and because the Knights do have to turn it around and there's going to be an element of nervousness in the first 20 minutes of their game that they can actually get get out there and get settled into the contest and play the football they want to play where the Cowboys, you know, um, look as though they've started in this sparkling form. But I'll I'll go Cowboy overnight but with no real confidence. Caelan Ponga playing against his old club, which yep. not many people remember. All right, another interesting game. But very short price favourites, North Queensland. I think the bookie's betting around a dollar forty-five. Yeah, well, that, that's what happens. You get an overreaction to how well they went, and an overreaction to how badly the Knights went. You know, I think that. Uh, um, yeah, I think it'll be a lot closer than that. Otherwise, you know, I, you know, I don't think I'm wrong about the Knights. I still think they're a good side, um, but they need to improve on that round one. Obviously, as Richie Callender would say, you can have a peanut on them at the odds. A peanut. Gives Richie peanut. Callender's peanuts are about 500. Um, Storm. These, these peanuts are making me thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Storm Warriors. Another one. I mean, Melbourne at home, how do you how do you doubt what they what they going to produce again after last week? Same team, no Munster, no uh, Alceva Solomona. And uh, Warriors, they think will be intact, but Egan suffered a knock last week and Kirk Capewell had a rib cartilage injury, but they say he's going to back up. So uh, another cracking game of footy at... I, the Warriors for the first twenty minutes, dead set, looked like they were they could win the comp. What they were just, they were um, they were so powerful and fast. I can't believe they lost. Yeah, I, I would hold that thought. I wouldn't write them off because no. they were beaten, and I didn't think they did a lot wrong to get beaten. It was just that Sharks just wore them down in the end. Um, and were able to get a couple of points through Talakai over there on the left, who was dynamic with his ball running both at both ends of the field. Although Talakai was outstanding. Mm. Uh, in his contribution the other night, uh, but certainly all the the Sharks forwards did a great job, and you tend to think, oh well, you know, maybe we've judged. I don't think the Warriors did much wrong to get beaten. I thought they were very good. And Storm, I mean, the, the defensive effort was unbelievable. How much that takes out of them mm. uh, is another thing. And you know, without Munster and a Sofa Solomona, where are their points going to come from? Their only points came from a kick the other night, wasn't it? A crossfield kick and a bat back. So. Um, whilst they were able to keep Panthers to nil, they only really scored the one try from a kick themselves. Panthers' defence was really good. Mm. Um, I, I think this is potentially an upset. I, I think there's really good value in the Warrior. I think this is potentially an upset game. I think, I think if the Warriors are the team that I think they are, I think they'll be really fancying their chances to go to Melbourne and cause the upset. And mm. Melbourne, you know, have still got a lot of work to do on their game. And Munster is still missing. 
Um, I can just feel that Warriors might have three or four tries in them, and that might be a bridge too far for the storm. Mm. I, you know, I just yeah, I'm 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 feeling an upset in that one. A couple of peanuts on the Warriors. Well, maybe a cashew. Gamble responsibly, but uh, I'm not tipping you to have a bet. I'm just saying that I think the Warriors. I think people are mm. underestimating their chances in this one. I think it's, they've got a very good chance of winning. I'm glad you mentioned that backup factor because after they bashed themselves with defence last week, it must be hard. You've got to come up again well, and do it again. And, and that, that's the reason why they win early season games. I mean, they're, they're, they're what we call redlining. They're, they're at full tilt when they, they start the season. Some clubs play their way into the season. Some clubs, you know, are looking to peak mid-season or peak it in September or peak a couple of times during the year. Craig Bellamy's team peaks in February. That's that they are flat out in February, and they hold it for a long period of time. And that's that's his that's the way he's always done. He treats every game like it's a grand final, and uh, he does it that way. So he's he's always got them ready, and they'll be ready to back up. They've got their first two games at home, which is a big advantage for them. Um, hmm. In this game last year, they were beaten by the Bulldogs at home, round two Ooh. last year. They were in fact, beaten pretty comprehensively by the Bulldogs in round two last year. So there was a little letdown after round one. And I think the Warriors, having been beaten at home in their home, in front of their home crowd, and they do like playing against Melbourne, I think. I'm kind of talking myself into it. Warrior, I? baby. I'm, I'm saying You've that. almost talked me into it. If you are a footy fan, I don't care who you support, get in front of the television at three o'clock on Sunday and don't move until the news. In fact, watch the news. Maybe go and get a cup of tea when the news starts. Manly, Roosters, baby. The two winners from Vegas in front of a full house at Brookie. The two gun fullbacks facing off. Um, they've lost Jason Saab. Yeah, that's a blow. Yeah, it is. Six weeks. Yeah. Um, Tommy Talau comes into play his first game for for Manly. Hooker Carl Lawton suffered an angle injury in round one, but it's named to play. Uh, Josh Schuster's back in the New South Wales Cup. But... Um, uh, Dominic Young is going to play for the Roosters, but oh, this is going to be unreal. Yep. Unreal. Roosters, notice they've been heavily back with the bookies. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, they were really impressive against the Broncos without being, um, you know, without being ultra flamboyant. They, they really just ground their way and, and ground the Broncos into the ground, which is the way that they felt they could beat them in round one, and they did. Broncos self in, self-destructed a little bit, but... Um, and Manly have just got so many points in them. They've got, you know, with Trebojevic and Cherry Evans and Luke Brooks now, they've got so many points in them. Um, it's got a beautiful spine there, experienced, and um, you know, they can really set this team alight. There, there are points in Manly, and they're very, very good at Brookville. Having said that, I just think uh, this is the best I've seen Roosters at this time of year. Uh, from round mm. one, obviously, last year was a disappointment to them, and they got themselves out of the contention for the eight three quarters of the way through the season. They kind of fluked their way into the finals last year, but they're leaving nothing to chance this season. I, uh, Brookie I'm, factor. I'm yeah. Well, you got to you got to fact. There's a lot of factors. You just got to weight them carefully and work out what it is. I just think early season. I'll back the Roosters. Kick, chase, and tackle mentality to maybe uh, keep the Eagles at bay. I'm going to tip Rooster. Okay. Away from home. And then the last game of the rounds. I like Sunday night footy. Just when you think it's over, it's not. I like that. Dolphins, Dragons. Mm -hmm. Dolphins, very disappointing. And you don't often see this from Wayne Bennett. He's axed the halfback after one game. Yeah. Isaiah Katoa's in. Yeah. He's made a few changes, actually. Jake Avarillo is going to make his debut in the centres alongside Herbie Farnworth. Um, Conley Lee Muelli has done a knee. Ray Stone has suffered concussion. They're both out big losses. Yeah. Um, you and Aiken back row. Max Plath is going to play lock. He had a coach against John Plath. Who? Yeah. 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 It's his son. Yeah. And uh, Jared Wallace comes onto the bench. And Dragon, Luciano Leilua is in. Blake Laurie's back. And Harme Sello's on an extended bench. They might be full strength. Yeah, well, they were my bet of the round last round, um, Dragon. I thought they'd beat the Titans, and they beat them quite comprehensively. Uh, Dolphins were poor defensively the other day. Um, they did, certainly didn't start the same the season this year the way they started last year, and I'm going to find it hard for them to be able to improve enough in the space of seven days to uh, 
to hold on to the Dragon, who um, will obviously get a lot of confidence out of their pre-season form and the fact that they had a good win last week. Um, I am going to tip Dragon, mm-hmm. which when we go back to the start of the games, let me go through them all again. So Thursday night, I'm tipping Bronco, mm-hmm. then Panther. Mm-hmm. Wait, oh, Bulldog, yep. Then Raider, mm-hmm. Cowboy, Warrior. Wow. Rooster. Dragon. Don't feel bad, people, if you're not going well in the tipping comp because no one is. And the early season form is always very, very hard. Two I, favourites I think, I think one I got, around one. I think I got five last week, which was good. But well, you'd be leading the thing with five. Yeah, I think so. Anyway. That's how we roll. All right. Thanks, Gus. Uh, enjoy the dinner party tonight, Wednesday night dinner party. Is the dinner party on tonight? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Full as they all get full as a state school and what abuse time? each other. Uh, 7 30, right have, after Ali Langdon and a current affair. I'll have to watch it on nine now when I get home because um, I'll have to be at uh, the junior academy training tonight. I like to go and watch the boys train. Mm, I'll yeah. get home a bit later. All right, make sure. I'll, I'll reheat my, de- my meal and I'll sit there in my little office and s- swear watch, at the screen. Watch maps. Now I know that you now I know that we're both <laughs> we're both watching maps. We can do a weekly recap. Uh-huh. We do a weekly recap. Uh-huh. And we'll start a campaign to make Gus a relationship expert for the next series. Now that would bring in the viewers. That's six tackles with Gus for this I'll, week. I'll do it if Rabs does it with me. I'll take Rabs with me. Oh what are you talking about, <laughs> you imbecile? Turn it up. See it, Penrith. This year NRL on 9 is your one-stop shop for all footy. That's right, Freddie. Not about the highlights. Action. Seven days a week. Billy and Gus podcast. Get that on your drive on the way home. Immortal behaviour. Grab a seat on the couch for that. And, of course, my favourite, Freddie and the Ain. The best footy brains, the biggest games. Don't trust the algorithm. Subscribe to NRL on 9 and get all your entertainment there.